All right, go. All right, so, um, and then people ask, are these studies useful? And I'm kind of like, yeah, you know, kind of useful. Um, they're not useless, that's for sure, but I wouldn't necessarily call them useful. And so we are relying on an imperfect system to help us manage commensal rodents. And, and that's just not ideal. And, and I think of like, when I think of zoonoses and I even think of like coronavirus, if we were to get corodent virus, and um, we'd essentially be screwed because we are not really well equipped to manage rodents um, right now. And so from an urban perspective, which is where I am coming from, um, if you try and imagine, and most of the time we have to imagine because we don't have the data, what is happening in an urban system when you manage rodents. And so we get this quarterly service where people are coming in and, you know, companies are coming in and they're managing every three or four months, you know, placing bait, checking traps, you know, not really doing um, a whole lot. And, and what we're probably getting is, you know, the pest management happens up here. Um, I'll just turn, turn to my pointer here. Pest management happens up here. And then, you know, we know that pest management is effective to a degree, but what happens is, is that it just rises up again because there's too great of a gap in between this point and when this um, next service is applied. Now, ideally in like a monthly management system which would be way more frequent um you would get you know you would get probably you know this fluctuating population but probably the amount of time where you manage the rodents is probably not it's probably still too long or at least we hypothesize that it's too long and, and it's not just because of the management it's probably because we're missing out on a step. So we're missing out on what we're calling complete rodent management. Now, I'm not sure you can ever reach this complete rodent management or, you know, a kind of a threshold of none, which is kind of what the acceptable threshold is for commensal rodents. You know, when people ask you how many rodents are too many rodents in a restaurant, the answer is zero. Um, and so what's happening here is, is that, you know, maybe this is sanitation. Maybe it's more appropriate management. Maybe it's more integrated pack, um practices, not just sanitation, but maybe like habitat modification and um, exclusion. And what that does is it drops your equilibrium to a level that's much, much lower. And maybe that's because there's more management or maybe it's because you've maybe removed resources that are available to the rat. I, I don't know. We just don't know. The important thing to remember is, is when it comes to rodenticide exposure, is that if you have this system or even worse, this system, all you're doing is growing back the rats, poisoning more of them, sending more of them out into the environment and repeating the cycle over and over and over again. And that's kind of important to remember because what happens down here is instead of poisoning all these rats and then growing all the way back up again, what you have is a much smaller um, increase in population because you have what's more complete management. And what's interesting about this is that this actually might take well, more frequent applications of pesticide, maybe not necessarily more pesticide, but more frequent applications of rodenticide to actually achieve this, which is kind of a little bit maybe backwards than the, at least the idealistic IPM principle. And so these are kind of, you know, models that are in, were in my head, and I've been showing these diagrams for a number of years, and now we actually have some real life data, and surprise, surprise, we're actually getting something similar um, in the in the wilds of the urban environment, when we look at these um, the tracking tunnels that we have, um, and the information we have on on rodent activity in areas before and after management, um, and this area here is, is is a large HOA that we're in in Southern California, and you can see that we have a pretty strong response to our bait, but we still have quite a lot of activity. This here is just our um, our a control site where you can see there's like a natural increase in the population. Um, over time and you know it's not at least reflected in this now we do have more data but it will make your your mind explode and we're still trying to figure it out and and we have different treatments in different sites and um, but we we're seeing the these pretty strong responses to our management which is good and i'm going to talk a little bit more about this project in the future but i want to talk about this imperfect system a little bit before we move on so even though we're getting a, such a strong response to um, our management, we still have tons and tons of activity. So why do we have so much activity? Well, commensal rodents have what we call neophobia. They're afraid of new things. Although I'm not really sure it's neophobia. It, it, 
I think there's maybe a difference between neophobia and, and, and avoidance, but I, it's hard for me to communicate that because we don't really know a lot of it. And so in our research, we're finding that the discovery of bait stations placed in people's yards and the entry into those bait stations is highly variable. So discovery and entry are two different things. Discovery is when we know that the animal is at least in the same like a view, camera view as the bait station. Um, and entry is when we detect the rodent actually entering into that bait station. And they can be, like I said, very variable and highly delayed. And we've seen this when we've looked at toxic bait and non-toxic bait. And so when we've looked at toxic bait, which is this graph, we can see that you know the, the response between discovery on the um, here and then entry is, is highly variable. So we know that they discover the bait station fairly quickly, although it could be significantly delayed. Um, and even if you look at um, here, you can see like it could be up to about two weeks till like like a, a, like the large majority of our bait stations are recovered or are entered. Sorry, discovered. If you look at entry, entry is 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 where the the rodent actually gets killed potentially potentially, and you can see that it is also highly variable and also can take a really really long time. And not only does it not take a long time, is that we're finding that a huge proportion of rodents, even though they're discovering bait stations, they're not actually entering into them either, which is a big issue because for rodent management in urban areas, we're almost exclusively relying on the application of either baits or traps inside bait stations. Now, we also looked at that, this um, kind of response in relation to non-toxic bait as well. And we looked at this in, in um, bait stations that were on the ground and bait stations that were elevated um, in um, an MPMA, a, pro a Pest Management Foundation funded project. And we found exactly the same thing, even with non-toxic bait. So like there's, there was like, there was, we didn't test them at the same time, but we saw kind of similar responses. And so realistically, figuring out neophobia is the key to success potentially for rodent management. So it mightn't even be like this kind of IPM idea. It might be that we need to just focus on very basic ideas of how do we get the rats um, in these stations and whether we kill them with pesticides or traps, that's not really part of the question right now. It's how do we even get them into the bait station in the first place? Because rats only entered between 37 and 70 percent of bait stations that they visited, which means between 30 and 60 percent of bait stations that they encounter, they never even go into. And so we're trying to figure out what's going on here. But we think that maybe the fact that we have even though we are reducing activity with our bait stations, the fact that we have so much activity is related to how the rodents are reacting around these devices. So whether it's neophobia or avoidance, there's definitely something going on. Now, recently I conducted some preliminary work with my colleagues from Orange County Vector Control um, and um, our colleagues from New Orleans Vector Control as well, um, where we looked at rodenticide resistance in California. Now, we only looked at rats from Orange County um, and we only looked at one particular mutation in the VKOR1C gene, which is the, the gene that is um, responsible, or we know at least has is responsible for resistance in rats in um, across the world. And what's interesting about this is that we found the Y25F um, mutation in a significant proportion of our rats, um, and we also um, found that um, you know this this um, SNP or this um, mutation is shows resistance to second generation anticoagulant rodenticides and and we wouldn't really expect that to happen because the second gens are more toxic and we wouldn't really expect that they've developed mechanisms to be able to combat that now we don't really know what this means we don't really know if the rats are like a little bit resistant or a lot resistant but thankfully with thanks to this um preliminary work we've now gotten a much larger grant to look at resistance across the united states now I want to move in a little bit about why we would study rodenticides and rodenticide exposure um, and, and talk a little bit more about this because we don't really have a whole lot of time left. And one of the reasons why we would do it is because we are finding pesticides and things that they're not supposed to be in. We would not expect rodenticides to be in any of these animals, um, although you could kind of, you know, it's not a big leap to see that birds of prey could eat um, you know, rodents that are exposed to rodenticides, you know, our predators could eat um, animals that are also exposed to anticoagulant rodenticides. 
but then you have things like this, like the Canada goose. Like I mean, we wouldn't really expect Canada goose geese to be, um, you know, exposed to anticoagulant or denticides, although they are. And then um, I'm so glad this is before lunch. You probably should come with a trigger warning. Um, but we um, we also have um, rodenticides showing up in our endangered species. And this is some um, pictures um, provided by Dr. Rudd from CDF, California Department of Fish and Wildlife. And on the left here, we have a San Joaquin fox that it has oh. not died from <laughs> anticoagulant rodenticide exposure. And here we have one that has, and you can see the difference, the blood in the belly, the blood in the, the thoracic cavity, the coagulopathy, the bruising on the skin. There's a lot of different things that you have to do in a necropsy um, along pairing it with um, the toxicology from the liver to, to prove, or at least to assume that the animal has died from intoxication. Um, and the endangered species issue is, is just not, um, you know, a California issue. We're seeing it in our fishers, we're seeing it in, um, you know, bald eagles and, and other listed species. Um, and that's a big deal because, you know, when one animal dies from exposure to anticoagulant rodenticides and they're an endangered species, well, then it kind of does become a population level impact which is fairly serious. We also see illegal applications. Um, you know, this is made from a homeowner in a public park. Well, we believe a homeowner in a public park. Yes, it could be a professional application, but we don't believe that it is. So this is second generation anticoagulant rodenticide applied for a squirrel issue. Um, you know, there's so many violations here. I We couldn't even get into all of them, but like for one of them is it's restricted use. You're not supposed to apply it if you're a homeowner. The second one is, is that you're supposed to apply it in a bait station. And the third one is, is that it's not registered for use on California ground squirrels. So not a big deal. This is a professional um, application. And this one is so ironic because this one occurred right outside the UCIPM building. And so my colleague alerted to me and and um, told me about it. But we, we don't really know exactly what happened. But, you know, more than likely, this block was not properly um, adhered inside the bait station. So, you know, we know that it's happening from, from different sides of the spectrum. We know that it's happening from professionals and we know that it's happening uh, potentially from unlicensed members of the, the public. And then in California, and I know we've got some people from outside the state um, attending, but we love our mountain lions in California and our mountain lions are like living with us in Southern California. Now P22 essentially lives in downtown LA, which is one of the most bizarre things I've ever heard in my whole entire life. But yes, there is a mountain lion that runs around downtown LA. Um, and they're, you know, what we call charismatic megafauna. Like who doesn't think that a mountain lion is, is cool and, and who wouldn't um, who would want to see it exposed and died from anticoagulant rodenticide. But, you know, this charismatic uh, megafauna and their exposure to rodenticide is, is really driving the legislation and potentially the regulations that are, well, the legislation that has come down in California, but potentially the regulations that are coming forward as well. And we see it everywhere. We don't just see it in California. We're seeing it in places like South Carolina, where Kiwa Island, the bobcats are um, exposed to anticoagulant rodenticides. We're seeing it in places like um, Massachusetts, where the state is also trying to ban the use of um, anticoagulant rodenticides. You know, we see it in places like Georgia, where we, you know, there's lots of, you know, there's papers coming through, like, you know, 80% of bald eagles, um, um, exposed to anticoagulant rodenticide and like a bald eagle expo um, exposed to a pesticide is almost like burning the American flag like I mean it's it's just it's almost just difficult to think that something could happen to like such a species and then there's there is a body of literature as well that talks about anticoagulant um, exposure in our predators in our our birds of prey and then there's also these papers that I kind of, oh, on our, or sorry, our endangered species, but also these papers that I kind of alluded to before where there's like things that you wouldn't expect to be exposed to anticoagulant rodenticide are exposed. So like non-raptor birds, you know, things like songbirds and, you know, pigeons and all sorts of things that you just wouldn't really expect to be exposed to anticoagulant rodenticides because they don't eat rodents essentially, or maybe they're being primarily exposed and we just don't know how. There's also a number of pet, pet exposures um, in the US. Um, and, you know, unfortunately, the exposure to anticoagulant rodenticide is increasing. Um, same with cholecalciferol, although I will draw your attention that the scales on the sides of these are quite different. Um, so don't be, um, don't be fooled by those. And what's interesting, I think, about in California and, and in a number of other states that the number of the number one toxicant that um, pets are exposed to is actually bromethylene. 
Um, and bromethylene isn't part of the legislation that recently came down in California, which essentially is a moratorium on the use of second generation anticoagulant rodenticides. The EPA also measures exposure to human cases um, or exposure to humans. And I'm not sure exactly how they do it. And they do it in two different ways. And um, the good news is that the exposure on the human side to second gens is actually decreasing. Um, but the exposure to the other compounds, so the first generation anticoagulant rodenticides and the non-anticoagulant rodenticides, which are probably things like bromethylene and, and cholecalciferol, um, those are increasing um, slightly, which is not good news. And then obviously in California, for those of you who are not aware, we have Bloom AB 1788, which is the Bloom Bill, California Ecosystems Protection Act. Um, and I don't expect you to read this unless you want to, but essentially what it is, is, is that there's a moratorium on the use of anticoagulant rodenticides, second generation anticoagulant rodenticides in California. And you essentially, if you're a professional licensed applicator, you, you have to jump through hoops um, to be able to apply this and can only apply it in very specific um, areas and under very specific conditions um, and with, you know, all sorts of permits and stuff like that. And so um, that's really what we're looking at here in California and potentially in other sites um, or other states like potentially Massachusetts, potentially the Pacific Northwest as well, South Carolina, which doesn't usually quickly follow in some of this pesticide legislation may also be included in that as well. However, there is kind of a flip side to all of this exposure. There are rat infestations all over the place. And I mean, I see that more so probably than anyone where we're seeing all these rats in all these places that like, I don't want to eat anymore. I would never, if I had kids, I would never send them to schools and they definitely wouldn't be eating school lunches. It's, it's kind of crazy. You know, we know that there's increased disease um, here in LA, um, you know, it's some of these kind of ironic you know at city hall was overrun with rats and we had typhus and we have typhus in downtown la i mean it it blows my mind that people would want to come to these places they're so dirty and so filled with rats and the same with new york you know and um, the the cases of human leptospirosis are increasing in new york and you know is it weather related is it rat related is it trash related we don't know. You know, we have plague in California. It's unlikely that you're going to get plague from a roof rat in California, although you could get it from a Norway rat. And I did actually just talk to my colleagues that we have two zero positive coyotes in Southern California. We're still waiting for confirmation from PCR. Oh, um, right on. I would say it's unlikely um, that it actually happened, um, but that it, they're actually positive, but they could be. I mean, it's just kind of scary to think that our disease surveillance in some of these species is just below par, really. Oh. Um, oh, and then yeah. at the Cali PA headquarters, um, okay. you know, they, you know, like the center of the place oh, that was essentially, you know, regulating and, and you know, part of the, the legislation oh, yeah. efforts the and stuff, um, just, just blew my mind. Like they had rats, they were using anticoagulant rodenticides, they failed, they had to, they started. I think I was talking to myself there for a second. Um, but anyway, so the, the um, there is also a growing body of literature on um, diseases and allergens. And you have to remember that, um, you know, um, early onset of, of, of asthma and sensitized children has been linked to exposure to rat urinary proteins and mouse urinary proteins. And it's something we don't really know a lot about um, in roof rat country, which is kind of more the Western United States and the Southwestern United States as well. Um, and so we have some literature on that. Um, we have, um, you know, information on ty typhus, um, soul virus, so kind of old word, hantavirus, um, you know, in cities and places like Vancouver. If you haven't checked out the Vancouver rat study yet, I highly recommend it. It is a fantastic study and some really great studies from New Orleans as well, looking at some prevalence of, of rodent diseases also. Um, and then there's schools. And I just, it blows my mind people that there are so many rats in so many schools in California. I just can't even begin to tell you how disgusting these places are. Um, this is a picture of, of a maggoty rat that fell from a ceiling in a school in California. I don't think I'll ever forget it as long as I live. Um, and like, this is just kind of normal kind of things that are happening in schools all day, every day. Like this is a rug mark. This is sebum 
from a rash that is on the railing that the kids are supposed to eat or use in the areas where they eat their lunch. And as that wasn't bad enough, there is uh, rat crap in the stove in the place that cooks their lunch. Um, and I could just I could go on for hours and hours and hours with galleries of photos of disgusting things that I found in schools. And so there's a whole heap of why we shouldn't use anticoagulant rodenticides. And then there's a whole heap of why we potentially need to keep anticoagulant rodenticides around. And I, I think that what needs to happen is, is that we need a little bit more middle ground where we figure out how to successfully manage rodents and successfully not contaminate wildlife in the process. Um, but we have to make sure that there is like there is an issue with the disease and um, there is um, it's important that we we focus on that. Now, you know, people and, and like I said, there's definitely people on this call that are from outside the state that will be like, oh, you know, California is crazy. Does pesticide, does pesticide legislation even matter in California? And we know that California is the first domino to um, essentially fall here. So um, it is important because, you know, with things like the Healthy Schools Act, probably with your label changes, for all things like that, that have started in California um, and that do come to other states. And so it is important to consider what's happening in California, not in a vacuum, but in a, in a general sense. So let's talk really briefly about who may be responsible for rodenticide exposure in wildlife in California. And so if you think of the pest management professional and how they apply anticoagulant rodenticides to kill commensal rodents that are eaten by birds of prey, um, coyotes, mountain lions, bobcats, things like that. We know that this happens. We know that anti we know that anticoagulant rodenticides are applied to control commensal rodents. We know that birds of prey eat commensal rodents. Coyotes don't weren't known to eat commensal rodents. Neither were mountain lions. Neither were bobcats. Now we know from our research that coyotes definitely eat roof rats, and so we think that if 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 this person is poisoning these and these are eating them, then this is a fairly logical way of how coyotes are getting exposed. Now, there could be something else where pest management professional obviously legally applies anticoagulant rodenticide in a bait station and something else potentially gets in there. And that's something else is maybe how a lot of this pesticide is getting around. Then we have our vector professionals that can apply some amount of, of pesticide or anticoagulant rodenticide. And you can see here in, in um, California, you know, we have um, approximate total pounds of rodenticide used and, and some of them use um, a lot of anticoagulant rodenticides, some of them use rodenticides and not a lot of those are anticoagulant rodenticides, there are other methods, maybe um, acute rodenticides or fumigants or something like that. Then there's this cluster where, you know, a homeowner gets a hold of it and then just there's no, sometimes you get these pesticides online, there's no label, there's no instructions, you just throw them out there and then it's just a free for all. Okay, so this is not ideal. And by the way, one of the ways we think that mountain lions are getting exposed it, to anticoagulant rodenticide is this way. We don't think that they're eating rodents, we think that they're eating coyotes that are exposed to anticoagulant rodenticide. And that's it. So it's not even secondary exposure, it's actually tertiary exposure. So let's talk about what's happening and what we know in California about exposure to anticoagulant rodenticides. And what we know from the California Department of Fish and Wildlife is that a whole heap of things are exposed, not necessarily dying from their exposure, but certainly exposed. And when you look at these things, some of them make sense. Right now, we know coyotes are exposed, eat rats and are, are, are get exposed maybe that way. But like, how does how does a bunny get exposed to anticoagulant rodenticide at least secondary yes maybe primarily how does um a beaver how does a squirrel how does a mole i mean who wants to eat the mole that eats or meet the mole that eats rats i mean it sounds kind of terrifying and um, so you know some of this could be primary exposure and it's unlikely that it's secondary exposure so that's a whole other question that needs to be addressed and then we know that our birds of prey are getting exposed to anticoagulant rodenticides um, but we don't know, um, and we know that they're dying from their exposure as well. So that's, you know, important to consider as well, but not really something that I'm um, not, I am concerned about, but it's not something that we, we work at. We're mainly focused in, in, in this um, food web or mess. And, and so we're trying to pick this apart um, and it's time consuming and difficult and expensive, but we are, I think we're getting there. And so um, what we're trying to do is we're trying to figure out how are rodents exposing um, 
coyotes, mountain lions, things like that. And we're mostly interested in the, in the exposure pathway to coyotes because coyotes are the top level, at least in my um, ecosystem. And so this is the part of the chain that we're um, in, uh, focused on. And so the question that we asked was, can above ground baiting reduce the risk of exposure to non-target wildlife? And so what we did is we placed bait stations on the ground and above the ground. And we used non-toxic bait in this situation um, because we didn't want to kill any non-targets. So we we're just interested on what went into the bait station and if applying that bait station off the ground would make any difference. And just a, a reminder for people, I am based in, in Orange County, which is mostly kind of roof rat territory. So we don't have, well, we may not even have um, nori rats or they're at least at undetectable amounts in Orange County. And we place these um, bait stations and cameras in people's yards, backyards. And in the first 30 days, we got everything but the mountain lion and the kitchen sink. And um, we had bobcats, raccoons, skunks, possums. We had, you name it, we found it um, in the backyard. And so that was pretty incredible. And, you know, what we were noticing is that we had in insane levels of rats. Like we were detecting like sometimes hundreds of rats in a night. Now, not necessarily at a site, but like just in um, in many, many different sites. And so, um, you know, our detections were, all, this wasn't really that unusual. You know, we know that rats are active at dawn and dusk. So that was interesting. And I, and I touched on this earlier on where we have this variable response to the bait stations. Some might even enter the bait stations. So that was kind of one of the more interesting things that we found from this study, like aside from looking at like how wildlife are getting exposed. So like I said, we found everything but the kitchen sink in here. And I'm going to take away the rats because the rats kind of, um, confuse what we're we're looking at because we know that rats are, um, are, are using the bait station and we know that they're getting exposed to anticoagulant or an site. we're interested to see if anything else did and so what we found out as well is that like a lot of things have visited the bait station but we didn't have a huge amount of like non-target access to the bait so they didn't actually enter the bait station but there at least is the potential for exposure there and you can see that um by elevating the grain, the bait station, everything but the Eastern Fox squirrel would basically have hardly any interaction at all with the bait station, which is exactly what we wanted to see, including our native rodents, which could be susceptible to exposure and that our carnivores could be eating as well. Now we didn't have no non-target access, but we did have very limited. We had some very interesting squirrelzilla moments where the Eastern Fox squirrel literally mowed the back off our bait stations, not ideal. But what we saw was, is that if we had the, the species presence, so wood rats, deer, mice, ground squirrels, if they were present, yes, they were likely to enter the bait stations, but that could be um, minimized by putting the bait station above the ground. Um, so that was helpful. Um, and you can see that some of our non-targets like this ground squirrel were successful, but others played with the bait station till the cows came home and couldn't even get at the bait. So let's talk a little bit about what we know and what we don't know from this research, which is very unbalanced. When it comes to rodenticide exposure, I really feel that we don't really know a whole lot compared to what we know. And so what this is saying is, is that primary exposure to non-target wildlife from legal applications of rodenticides for structural pest control is unlikely to be a major source of exposure. So that's really good news. And that means that exposed non-target preys of carnivores are unlikely to be a major pathway. So we don't believe that these non-targets potentially that we thought might be accessing, accessing, accessing the bait, that we know that the carnivores eat, we don't believe that those are part of the pathway. What we do know is that primary exposure could be mitigated by placing the rodenticide bait stations off the ground, at least in our system. And um, it will be interesting to see if that's true in other people's system as well. And then the other thing that we saw is that rats respond a lot to bait depletion, which is interesting. So especially in areas with high and intermediate activity, we were seeing these kind of peaks every seven days, which is when we replaced the bait. And so that's pretty interesting. And then so um, one of the things that we're trying to communicate to pest management professionals is that bait stations without bait or without traps can't kill rats. And so it's kind of important, especially with what we know about bait station dynamics, you know, a rat may only ever visit a bait station once. And if it comes in and there's nothing in there or something that's non-toxic that can't kill it, um, that could be a problem. And so we don't want this population recovery um, because we don't want more intoxicated rodents that could potentially um, be intoxicating or at least exposing the carnivores that eat them. And we also know that yard type matters. So we know that people with solid walls actually have way less wildlife in their um, in their backyards and then obviously reduced um, 
risk of exposure. And um, so that's good to know as well um, in our system. And then once again, figuring out this neophobia is, is the key to success because we need to make sure that we're killing these rats and that they're not bringing their populations back up again. Now, the other thing that we looked at is we looked at like um, what might be scavenging dead rats. And so um, our volunteers are pretty much the most, mo most amazing people in the whole world because they let us put dead stinky rats in their backyard for seven days and monitor what came along. And we had all sorts of things that came along and things that make me think that maybe there's important other pathways that we're not even considering, like the invertebrate pathway. And so like that's something that we need to work on um, when I get five minutes, which is probably not likely anytime soon. So let's focus on how are urban carnivores getting exposed. So we looked at their diet in two different ways because we want to know what they're eating. And so we looked at like a hard part analysis where someone took the stomach apart from coyotes and basically picked apart everything inside it to see what was in there. Then we did, um, I don't know if you guys saw that video there, but we did the molecular margarita where Jen took everything that Danielle took away from the stomach and she put it in a blender, she blitzed it up and then she extracted the DNA and we looked at just in case we missed something. So now in our system, we're kind of trying to pull this pathway away. Does Vergensite get into commensal rodents and do commensal rodents get into coyotes? We have so many coyotes in Southern California. That number 550 is probably at least 100 more now. And we get them from federal, state, county agency, pest management professionals. We get them from all over, but we're mainly focused in Orange and LA counties um, in Southern California. And here's the thing that we didn't know. Coyotes eat rats. And because they eat rats, that could be a source of exposure from legal applications of second gens, which is kind of something that was new. But however, there are other potential sources of second gens that we do need to explore including the ridiculous amount of cats that we found in um, coyotes. And people are like, oh, just because you find these things doesn't mean that they're exposed. We've that cover too. We have like 99% of our samples of urban coyotes in Southern California are exposed to anticoagulant rodenticides. And so lots exposed to bromodilone, brodificum, difethylone, and difatinone as well. And then the other ones are kind of like there, thereabouts. And um, we're also continuing detecting cumatectrolil. Uh, we believe that it's a real detection, um, although there could be um, some issues with the analysis because it, its peak um, is pretty close to one of these other ones that I'm not quite sure I can't remember. So let's summarize what we know and what we don't know. The detection of cumatectrolil is probably evidence that there is a legal exposure of rodenticides in Southern California, especially because considering we keep detecting it in the same area. That sent me down this really crazy pathway of trying to see if I could buy illegal rodenticide online um, and had to stop um, because I can, and I was very good at it. Um, I think that you have to be smart about it. I don't think it's as easy as it could. But like I said, when I said that these things turn up in bags that have no labels in them, they look like candy. They're, I mean, you know, their instructions are in different languages, you know, from a different country, from a different country, from a different country, all not registered in the US. This one, this one, this one, this one, all not registered in the US. We don't even know what this is. Um, we think it might be counterfeit rodenticide, so also illegal, but like we think that someone just kind of randomly made something and um, it looks like a Neogen product, but I've been in contact with Neogen and they don't know what it is. The big question though is, is exposure to urban coyotes occurring from legal applications of anticoagulant rodenticide by pest management professionals? And I really do believe it is. Now, do we have 100% evidence that it's occurring? No, we do not. Um, is it likely that it's happening? Yes. However, there's a flip side to that, because even if it is true that exposure is happening from legal applications, it may not be having any population level impact on coyotes in suburban uh, or in, in, um, sorry, in urban Southern California, at least, because in urban Southern California, our coyotes are probably expanding their range and increasing their density. Yeah, at least we think they're exposed at the level. And I don't mean that they're just a little bit exposed. Some of our coyotes have ridiculous levels of rodenticide in them. They, sh they shouldn't silly be walking around. I just don't know what's happening. However, once again, I feel like this talk is full of lots of howevers. It may be that um, coyotes are um, have sublethal effects. So I, I always describe sublethal effects as like, you know, just say me and Jim go to the bar and um, we have 10 pints. Um, Jim doesn't wake up in the morning because he's American, he can't drink 10 pints. Um, I wake up with a hangover. So Jim has the lethal effect and I have the sublethal effect, except we're, we're cut from the same cloth. We're like the same species, but we have totally different reactions 
to this pesticide exposure. And that could be happening. And so we tried to look for sublethal effects. And um, once again, another amazing student um, that we worked with looking at the sublethal effects of rodenticide exposure at urban coyotes. And we found once again, tons of coyotes exposed, at sometimes at ridiculous, like look at this, ridiculous levels of um, rodenticide exposure and um, you know we know that we have a lot of compounds that they're exposed to we know that um we're, our, our sample is particularly biased towards young coyotes and we don't know if that's a bias of our sample or if that's an artifact of the population and um, but we do have a lot of young maybe stupid coyotes that are getting themselves into trouble and we couldn't find a really apparent um relationship between like at least body condition and ar exposure and we looked at a couple of other things and the jury's still kind of out on this one and um, we're still looking into it and, and we're just finished um actually the um that project and and hopefully we'll have some publications out re um soon about what's going on there but it looks like there might be more of a um a deleterious effect from the first gens and not the second gens which is interesting now, I know we're running out of time and we're getting really close and, and I don't know if um, I can finish it in the next few minutes, but I will try. And so we have funding from the Structural Pest Control Board where we have made a uh, rodenticide that we believe we can trace up through multiple trophic layers. Um, and this project funded by the Structural Pest Control Board, basically what happens in normal terms is you apply a rodenticide, a rodent eats it and a coyote eats it. But the problem is, is that that rodenticide could have come from anywhere. What we've done, and I call this the glowing rat project, is we essentially labeled our, our bait in a way that means that it can be um, detected in the rat and then detected in the coyote that consumes it. And so we're still working on that project, but we're getting there. And so realistically, what that does is, is that allows us to trace the rodenticide back to a point source. And so we're very excited about this project and hoping to start it very, very soon. Well, we've actually started it, but hoping to start the application of the, um, the, the, the glowing rodenticide fairly soon. And what that does is, is that essentially opens up this whole entire environment where we can tr trace these rodenticides through it. Um, and we're hoping to, to do um, lots more of exciting things with this. Now, we also have a, um, a, a project funded by the California Department of Pesticide Regulations to look at developing best management practices to manage urban rats. And we had a BMP workshop and it was, um, it, it went okay. There was a lot of good ideas. The problem is, is that I don't believe that there we're thinking about the source of the problem and we're too focused way way up there in the top of the food chain when essentially the problem is right down at the bottom are rats getting exposed to anticoagulant rodenticides and if they are how can we mitigate that and to mitigate that we need to focus on like reducing the amount of rats that get exposed to rodenticide which reduces the amount of rats that are um, exposed predators and and that's not something that I believe that we're really thinking about well I'm thinking about it but I don't believe from a regulatory or, or legislative perspective I, I don't think we're thinking about it like in a management way and I, I think that's what we really have to do and so some of this is helpful but not really like like I said what we need we need to reduce the amounts of rodents exposed to AR not actually reduce the amount of ARs that are applied um, and I, I know that that's kind of an almost like a backwards IPM approach um, but we need to make sure that we're killing the rodents now obviously there could be other integrated approaches that we take the problem is is how did the rats respond to them and we don't know that and so our proposed action for re reducing the proposed um, proportion or the reducing the proportion of rats that are exposed to anticoagulant rodenticide is, is this mixed management approach. It's an integrated approach where you look at trapping first and then using anticoagulant rodenticides or trapping in conjunction with anticoagulant rodenticides. So essentially you're almost killing the rats twice or potentially using acute rodenticides first followed by ARs. So what you're doing is you're knocking down the amount of rats and then not, you need to follow up those. So you need to make sure that we're not growing back these rats. And that's really important. Now, this is a very challenging um, program to achieve. And so basically what we're doing is we're testing how quick our management options can kill 10 rats, 10 collared rats in different management systems. So one is second generation anticoagulant only, one is trapping only, and one is mixed management, which is trapping and anticoagulant rodenticide. And you can see just from our, our, our video there, it, it involves this really complicated telemetry system that's got all these wires and computers and boxes and batteries. And I'm really good now at stripping wires, which I had, it wasn't a skill that I had before. So that's helpful. And you know, what we do is we trap and we collar rats and we let them go again. And so it's also a bit of a, a thing to, um, you know, when we ask our partners, 
can we trap rats in their um in their area they're pretty excited to do so but when we tell them that we're letting them go again they're they're not so um keen about it but then in, in another backwards fashion, we are measuring how quickly we kill these rats. Um, and because, um, you know, the, our partners are happy to let us go, come back when they realize that we're, we're learning how to do this. And what this is generating is data like this that you've seen um, me show previously, which is this activity data where we are seeing fairly strong response to our applications, but we have more, um, you know, we've more, much more data in the pipeline. We're also getting some interesting movement data. Um, I don't have time to get into this system. It's not 100% uh, accurate. Like I wouldn't be putting so much faith in it, but what we are seeing is like the distances that our rats are moving are pretty low. And so, um, sorry, we're, you know, this is kind of the data we see because we're mostly interested in when the rats die, not really essentially where they are in their home range. We just want to know when they die because if you're trying to measure the effectiveness of a bait application for commensal rodents, it's actually pretty difficult to do to figure out when they die. And, and, and even then it's hard to determine if that's what they died from. So we're kind of, I wouldn't say we're clutching at straws. I would just say that it's not the perfect system. Um, and so we're really excited. These two rats are definitely dead. And I know that, well, I know that one's definitely dead because I found it the other day. Um, but we assume that these two rats are dead and these ones are still alive after several months of management, which is just really interesting. Um, also working with my colleagues from um, Los Angeles County, the Ag Commissioners um, Weights the Measure, I actually see one of them here um, today, and so they're helping us look at, um, you know, coyotes and, um, you know, we're seeing that our coyotes that are likely exposed to anticoagulant rodenticides are living for a really long time. Um, and so that's pretty interesting as well. And then we have some ag research. I don't really have time to get into it, but like looking at like um, how, where and when, um, uh, California ground squirrels are where are what kind of levels our coyotes are getting exposed to, which is nothing compared to the urban system, which is interesting. So I would say in California, yes, ag is a bit of a problem, but I wouldn't say that it's the biggest problem. And so I would be less inclined to throw ag under the bus um, in this scenario. And so really quickly, just to finish off, what lessons can be learned from California? Stab in the dark legislation regulations just don't work. They just do not work. We need to have data-driven mitigation measures. And the problem with that is, is that we don't know what we're doing. And so rats are likely to be a major part of the rodenticide pathway. And so we need to focus on those, uh, on that. Like this is the main thing that I believe that we need to focus on if we're going to try and reduce rodenticide exposure. And the more we learn about rat management, the more I realize we know so little. Um, by the way, this is another photo from a school um, uh, of a rat that um, is no longer with us. Um, but it's important. We need to know, like we can't manage what we can't measure. And so, you know, the data that's needed to make better decisions is just not there. And one of the reasons it's probably not there is because there's not that many rodent people in the, in the United States helping us answer these questions. And if you don't know how something is broken, you just can't fix it. And so um, I'd like to thank um, my team. I don't have time to measure them, mention them individually, but a number of students and staff and my collaborators at UC Davis and Cal State Fullerton. And we don't have time for questions. I'm already late for my one o'clock, um, but I would be really happy to answer questions. Um, you know, give me a call, send me an email. Actually, you can give me a call. I probably won't answer my phone, but I will call you back if you leave a message. And, you know, try and follow us on social media. And um, we're on Twitter at uh, SCUWM Council. And um, if you want to learn more about our coyote and our rat collaring work, you can find us on Instagram at Cosmopolitan Coyotes. And then we have a, a little bit of a write up um, on www.ucscurry.com. And then the most important person to thank is, of course, Jim, because we wouldn't have had this presentation without him. And I'm sorry that I had to go a mile a minute but um the, it's it's recorded at least and maybe there'll be semi-accurate subtitles so if you didn't understand what i was saying uh, that might help out so um thank you so much folks and and sorry about the mix-up and and hopefully um you know hopefully hopefully matt's okay yeah thanks thanks neve that was fantastic fascinating um research and i i can't i I don't understand how you can present that quickly, but that was fantastic. Yeah, <laughs> it's it's in the genes, Jim. <laughs> yeah. Along with along with their ability to consume ten pints. <laughs> yes. No, I don't have that ability. <laughs> uh, clearly. <laughs> All right, folks. Thanks very much. And like I said, if anyone has any questions, just feel free to um, send me um, send me an email, or if you want to chat more in depth about like the response in your state or anything, I'd be happy to do so. Great. All right. Thanks, Neil. Bye, folks. See ya. Bye, folks.